Josh, you know, we just covered InMed's uh, quarter yesterday. Yep. And, uh, you know, unlike or much like most of the sector, you're still in a development phase. So there wasn't yep. a lot of, uh, well, there's no profit, obviously. But you were making advances in one of the drugs in particular that caught our interest, INM750, which had to, uh, was an approach to treating the disease that is probably one of the most horrible things that anybody could go through. Right. Epidermolysis bullosa. Epidermolysis bullosa. What will, is that? We will call it EB. EB is a um, malfunction of the glue that holds the two layers of the skin together, the dermis and the epidermis. Uh, it's a genetic condition, unfortunately, so children are born with it. It's very, very severe, and um, the particular part of EB that we're working on is a subset that relates to a regulation of a certain protein called keratins. Mm. So we're hoping not only to alleviate the symptoms, of which there are several and quite severe, but also to help uh, the skin teach itself to grow again. Wow. Interesting. So what is the current available treatment that is not uh, cannabinoid derived? Well, there are none, unfortunately. Uh, there are no approved drugs for EB. So EB patients, unfortunately, use a myriad of creams and ointments and bandages. Uh, essentially, it's, it's a children's disease. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the children do not advance to uh, more than 20 or 30 years of age, sadly. Mm -hmm. And they spend most of their time bandaged up from head to toe. Well. And they have a number of uh, ointments and creams that are working on wound healing and itching and pain, inflammation, things like that. Hmm. So we are, we are hoping to hit this right on the head. Wow. Okay, so InMed's business model is essentially to isolate cannabinoid molecules and create proprietary drugs from them. Right. And you guys, I've just sort of cottoned on to the idea that you guys aren't growing marijuana plants, you're biosynthesizing your cannabinoids. That's right. And tell me about that process, because I've only had a couple of guests in here who can do that, and that scares the bejesus out of all them farmers out there, I'll tell you. It certainly does, and by the way, none of them want to be farmers. Right. Um, they all would prefer to just sell products to mm -hmm. the marketplace. Uh, what we do is we create a DNA blueprint, so to speak, of each of the 90 cannabinoids, mm. and through some high technology, um, we insert high that technology? high technology <laughs> okay. and high science. We are able to transplant uh, the cannabinoids into a fermentation broth that uh, grows and develops the broth. Okay. So at the end of the process, which is very, very short, uh, you get 100% highly pure pharmaceutical grade cannabinoids. Mm. So it could be very disruptive insofar as if we can get this right and get the cost structure right, then theoretically we can supplant the growing, extracting, harvesting market. Okay, so is, is, it, <clears throat> is it the case of where you're actually using genetically modified yeasts, enzymes, and... Sort of, yes. Okay. Um, so some of our, most of our competitors, in fact, are using yeast to bioferment. Um, we believe, we actually went into this agnostically. We looked at yeast and bacteria. The bacteria we use is E. coli. Mm. And again, we went into this agnostically and we found much more robust results with the E. coli production methodology. And we have been able to wrap uh, some very serious IP around that, which mm. is not the case with the yeast platform. Right, so there's gonna be a positive use for E. coli bacteria. Absolutely. <laughs> Interesting. Correct. All right, so then how far off are you to be able to, to being able to create commercial scale uh, quantities of cannabinoids using this process? Right, so we have spent the last three plus years actually trying to perfect um, which, what's called the plasma or the vector, which is the underlying science. And we're now moving to um, uh, a portion of the technology that is working on sort of the scale up uh, part of it. So we're able to do a number of these cannabinoids or produce a number of these cannabinoids at what's called a benchtop scale. Mm -hmm. And now we're working to scale it up to a commercial scale. Mm. And so what we think we'll be able to get there in about nine to 12 months. Sure. So the National Research Council of Canada is involved in this? Are Absolutely. they just funders? Uh, no, um, they're strategic partners with us. They um, are going to be side by side with us in this biofermentation process. Mm. Uh, they have great facilities and um, and we're hoping that uh, they remain very good partners to us going forward. Okay, so they're providing scientific verification, participation? Exactly, a, a lot of know-how, some money, um, resources, things of that nature. Well, very interesting. 
Okay, so you you filed uh, a patent application for treatment of pain with cannabinoids back in September. Right. And is that sort of the value proposition for the company to investors? Is that you're going to create patented medicines that will arguably, theoretically, potentially become mainstream one day and blockbuster drugs in and of their own? Absolutely. So we're working, you can really think of our company as twofold. The, the first one is what we call a uh, disruptive uh, platform technology, uh, where we're able to manufacture any cannabinoid um, at a commercial scale and at pharmaceutical grade, mm. right? So that can be good for us, that will be good for us. We also think that that will be applicable to pharmaceutical companies. So for example, if the Pfizer's, Merck's, Lilies of the world, you know, say, hey, Inmag, can you manufacture for us, you know, cannabinoid number 72 and 21 for the treatment of COPD or lung cancer, psoriasis, you name it, we will be the address. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's business number one. That's, I think, the golden egg. Uh, business number two is a really interesting R&D platform. So we're working on this rare skin condition called EB, and we're also working on glaucoma and uh, trigeminal pain, which is pain that emanates from the trigeminal nerve right here. Hmm. Yeah, the essence of migraines, I guess. Yeah, it's actually called the suicide pain, or oh. the suicide migraine. Because it's, it's so bad you just want to kill yourself? And unfortunately, there are several cases where that has happened. Wow. So they liken it to a somebody uh, being struck with a lightning bolt. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, so then, I mean, what is the rate at which these these uh, drugs have the potential to be developed and launched into commercial use or to, uh, I mean, is there an FDA process that needs to occur or a Health Canada process in Canada? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the EB program is our most advanced program. We think we are under a year from getting into the clinic. We will mm -hmm. be talking to the regulators, both Canadian and U.S. regulators, within the next several months to give us some guidance on the phase one. And, uh, and then we'll be in the clinic. Now with an orphan indication such as EB, that means you know there are no approved drugs and there are very few companies um, in the market working on that and even fewer you know, patients that can be served by that. Hopefully we'll be able to speed through the uh, clinical trials and get onto the market hopefully by 2021, 2022. Hmm. Wow, okay then uh what is the patient coterie size of EB sufferers globally? Yeah, it's actually very difficult to get epidemiology data on EB, but we think it's between 10 and 50,000 patients worldwide. Wow. Uh, again, it's difficult to get the numbers, but our base case uh, we assume is 10,000 and we can easily get, we can justify a commercial case of a billion dollar drug with that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the biosynthesis of cannabinoids, how many competitors do you have that you're aware of globally? And what is the sort of, where do you sort of stack up against those competitors? Um, okay, so there are uh, probably a small handful of companies that are doing it with a yeast-based production system. Again, ours is E. coli. We're not aware of any other companies that are working on E. coli. So we stand alone uh, doing that. Um, ultimately, the end users, are, again, are gonna be the pharmaceutical companies that are looking for pharmaceutical grade cannabinoids for uh, unmet medical needs, and potentially the recreational market. If we can get to a scale and a cost structure uh, that is competitive with you know, the growing harvesting and extracting model, and I think we will be able to do that, then this uh, potentially could supplant that industry altogether. Hmm. So you think there's a real chance that you know, the majority of cannabinoids that we find in consumer packaged goods I mean, obviously, you're never going to compete with the premium dried flower market in the bio, from biosynthetic sources, at least, unless there's a replicator out there. But, but so, all of the consumer packaged goods, topical creams, cosmeceuticals, beverages, foods, candies, could all be basically fueled by biosynth biosynthetically derived cannabinoids. That's correct. And I would say even the flower market, um, more and more, you do have your hardcore sort of um, folks uh, that are interested in partaking in cannabis use via, via flower, mm -hmm. but a growing number of those folks are looking for more purified, um, consistent strains through oils and extractions. And there, if we choose to go down this path, um, yes, we will be the address. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's great, Josh. We're going to keep watching. We'll come back to you in a quarter's time to see how you're doing. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. We'll be right back. We are going to talk to Hamad Shabazi, who is the CEO of a new company, 
And if you don't remember the name Hamid Shabazi, that's probably because you don't remember TO Networks. TO Networks was a great success. And Ahmed has now got a new uh, company, Well Health Technologies. And here.